The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hey, buddy. Gentlemen. Buddy, what's going on, man? Uh, not much. Just chilling. Going through uh, a big update here. FreeBSD just released 14. They actually released it like last month, but I never update immediately because um i don't know i always figure there's probably a bug or something so i usually wait a month or so anyways going through some update troubles but uh you know maybe i'll get that worked out today okay okay nerd, nerd, cool. nerd shit nerd yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, i can't I just run you bunty like everyone else yeah you're you're you're, you're hardcore man i think well, everybody technically I'm, I'm using you bunty on a virtual machine the microphone sounds better for whatever reason on on Ubuntu, but um, yeah, that that is funny. Why do you think that is? That's um, true. I don't know. Like I, I've I've meant to give it another hack, but it's like when you have something that works, it's like, well, why fix? You know, don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Mm, Got yeah. a virtual machine that does its thing. There's no reason. Here, here's here's I mean, a it's crazy. not like he's resorting to Windows. It's still Linux, but. <laughs> Here's a crazy question. I'm probably asking the wrong crowd because you guys are gonna probably steer me down the wrong road. But my my daughter needs a new laptop. Um, you would kill me if she if you knew what she currently has. She's currently using a, a Google Chromebook. Um, she's she's only you know she's she's young. She's only like nine years old, and she's got to you know do a lot of Google stuff for school. So she uh, you know. She, they have her logging into these different things, Google related things. But what would you guys have any recommendations for a decent laptop that maybe I could get her to like start to go down the the more technical path? Uh, I mean, Tux, you go for it, man. I think your I think your technical knowledge, particularly on Linux, is significantly beyond mine. Well, I know a lot of people aren't going to like this, but I will be honest that Chromebooks are actually for like someone like your daughter. Chromebooks are actually a decent option, just okay. not for like, you know, it's Google and it's all Google software in terms of security. They're really good. They're very locked down and okay. there's almost no way your daughter's going to like screw something up, but it's I'm a Chrome. It's a Google Chromebook, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so if you want something that's like going to promote her to like, tinker mess with stuff maybe break exactly. something and fix it exactly uh then <laughs> you could get a there's there's a few there's a few companies i'm thinking of like there's system 76 they have laptops that come with linux on it um there's a company called tuxedo <laughs> not tuxedo tuxedo right actual tuxedo yep. uh tuxedo computers they make linux computers uh or just laptops that come with linux on it um, and a framework's also really nice, but those are very compatible with Linux, but don't come with them. You'd have to install that. Mm. If you want her to use something like Linux, then those would be decent options. Um, if you like System76 and Tuxedo are the two first ones that come to mind if you want a, a decent laptop that uh, can come with a Linux operating system pre installed so you don't have to like, you know, mess with installing that yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to. Obviously, I wanted to have something that's super usable because that's the most important. Like, it's got to. It's got. Yeah, work. no, I mean, those laptops are designed to just work out of the box, yeah. like a web browser. You know, you don't really have to do anything. They just, they just yeah. kind of work. Um, now, I don't know how much benefit she's going to be getting if she has to use Google stuff. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. it would still be. It's, it's more so a... like, except for the tinkering, right? So she's just she's yeah. not always behind this walled garden. Like she could. Yeah. Start to figure out the the deeper inner workings. All right, cool, man. Appreciate the advice, um, body. Sorry about that. You can you, you can take no, it away. <laughs> I gave my niece a laptop, um, and then we installed. She was like, I think she was like eleven or something. This was years ago, and we installed um, Linux Mint together, and then she used that fine with no problems for for years. And oh, I don't know the laptop went could put. I'd probably give her Ubuntu now, like if I looking back, you know. But because um, Ubuntu just like it feels nice, it drives nice, it's. Like everything's just easy. Almost everything basically works. Um, awesome. But, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So I guess we should go ahead and get started on price here. Get chit chat yeah. all day long. Um, okay. So Monero technically broke that 170 level we were looking at, but <laughs> not not for long. Like it barely broke it, and um, 
like it, it looks still positive here. Um, you know, probably this thing will continue to drift up. Uh, at, at some point, like we'll probably see some big spike to the upside. In my mind, if we see we an see arrow it. make... Um, was that anyone that wanted to say something or was that like feedback? I think that was feedback. Okay. I'll, I'll, you know. Um, so uh, what we might see here at some point, what I would like to see is Monero pump maybe um, maybe to this this horizontal area right here. And if a Monero pump to that area, I would consider that a sign that there's more gains to be coming here in the crypto market. So Monero, Monero would probably like pump, level off, you know, do some weird oscillation shit like it tends to do, um, kind of like right what happened here. So probably it'll pump up here to this area somewhere. And if that happens, then I'll take that as a sign that there's more gains for cryptocurrency overall. Um, we had some more ratio um, pain over the past week. Basically, Bitcoin decided to take a nice big, another fat pump um, up to the 44,000 area, which we'll take a look at in a second. And uh, Monero did not pump with it. And so it, it dropped off. And that's... Um, I mean, basically, we're we're looking at falling below that trend line. We 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 have fallen below the trend line. At this moment, it's um, the week hasn't closed down there, right? So if it just wicked down there and came back up, you'd say, "All right, that's just a wick." Um, but if this thing closes a week, this week, and then next week down here, honestly, like that's just really that's that's not good. Like that's that's not good price action, at least from a technical analysis charting perspective. One thing with crypto is that it it's so very often doesn't do exactly what you would expect it to do from TA. And I mean, that's kind of true of everything. So this breakdown doesn't necessarily mean terrible things that we're about to crash on the ratio. But um, I mean, I do think that overall, you've got you've got the general positivity, you've got the markets that all look bullish, you've got um, the macro that looks like it still has more to give. I don't think that what's happening right here with the pumps in the stock market, which we'll take a look at as well. I don't think any of this is responsible. Uh, I think all of it is just like a terrible kind of bad idea. Um, markets really should need, they really need to just chop for a while. They don't need to be pumping like this. This just spells inflation down the road. That's, it's really all that matters or all that, all it means. Um, uh, but okay, you know, whatever, got some gains. How are you going to complain about gains? Uh, so here's Monero versus Ethereum kind of, um, you know, we've broken down here on this, uh, on the lower standard deviation bands, which are the orange bands. You can see they've already curled under. So at this moment, in terms of the standard deviation analysis, okay, maybe it could come back um, and sort of meet these bands as they curl under, but this is like classic, um, this is classic sort of bear market or downside activity. So really what we're looking for here now is to find a bottom uh, on the ratio to, of Monero to Ethereum. We're looking to find a bottom here um, at, the, at those lower standard deviation bands. So technically that would be from our current spot that would be about another 10% down um, versus Ethereum again. So um, yeah, that's kind of what Monero looks like here relative to the other coins. This this um, this head and shoulders, it's technically still in play. Um, if we were to go down onto the daily time frame, you would be able to see that the standard deviation analysis, basically um, this should act as some kind of support, but at the same time, um, there is like, there's kind of this danger that this thing could break down even further. Um, there's no reason that this area necessarily, uh, that area right there, there's no reason that necessarily has to hold. Um, these are shorter time frame bands that have curled under, so they're not as powerful. Um, the, when the long-term bands start curling under or curling up, in the case of the blue bands, the upper standard deviation, um, the very long-term bands, when they start to move, that's generally a sign of a large macro movement um, that's in progress or just beginning incipient. So, um, yeah, I mean, the head and shoulders is still technically in play. You know, like we talked about, it will get invalidated um, when we make it down here to this area. Somewhere around there would basically invalidate the head and shoulders. Technically, it's not invalidated yet. You could still, um, you know, you could still call this a head and shoulders and it would be valid. So, um, yeah, we'll just keep watching that again. It's a very large pattern. It's going to take months to play out. Um, I, I don't necessarily trust or believe a lot of this crypto pump. We have seen so many of the old shills, the old degens um, come out of their caves, come out of their, I don't know, their little hidey holes to, to come out and tell people like, get get long, we're going to 300,000 and all this like hopium and all this crap. And it's like, okay, yes, it, things are going up, but I really don't like, th this feels fake to me. There's a lot of this that just feels fake. Now, um, again, you've got the government printing so much money now. There is a component to this that's real. 
and we've got the ETFs coming out. So that's again, that's that is kind of like a real thing that's that's there. Um, but I just I don't know. It just seems like things are just too far ahead of themselves. Um, I you know we still haven't seen like why has this not closed yet? Why has the GPTC premium still not closed? It's still trading at minus seventeen percent, minus fifteen percent. At best, it got to minus fourteen percent versus the actual net asset value of the Bitcoin held in the trust. So it's like, why hasn't this closed yet? Where are the institutional buyers that are saying, hey, like there shouldn't there be big money right now? Shouldn't there be big money saying, hey, the ETF is going to get approved. Um, we're entering a new bull market. Shouldn't this thing have gotten bought up? Because isn't that like a free 15%? And maybe I'm just being uh, impatient here because, you know, you can you can clearly see the trend is uh, the trend is is to, to be closing. Um, so maybe that will take until at this rate, maybe that will take until March of next year. Um, I don't know. I guess we'll just have to wait and see there. But at any rate, um, you know, people can at least celebrate that uh, you got a nice move here, right? Let's um, let's take a look at how much that was technically. Since last week, we got 17% on Bitcoin. So, I mean, that's nice. Broke out of the uh, the sort of capping resistance here. Um, we'll go ahead and turn on the wave magic, uh, the standard deviations. So you can see the horizontal line. Sorry, these charts. I mean, you got to be patient with them. Uh, you can see the horizontal line. Like that is a very natural area for resistance. Um, this 47,000 spot, 47 and a half thousand, right? That was like after after the full peak in 2021, November 2021, everything you know fell back. And then that was like as far as things could get in 2022 of March or March of 2022. So like that's a very natural place. And you'll notice that it, um, it just so happens to coincide um, with the top of the standard deviation bands. Now, if we really wanted to look at these standard deviation bands and to show you um, why that why they're useful in a long term sense, uh, let's go to BLX. Um, if you want to see why they're useful in a long term sense, I'm going to delete these lines. These are just going to get in the way. Um, you'll notice, for example, on the last bull market, and they're not really looking so great. Let's go to the three days. You'll notice on the last bull mar uh, bear market bull market cycle that these standard deviation bands were effectively like the topping area for the first rebound. And we're basically still in that first rebound. It's been longer, right? It's been uh, a more sustained kind of movement. Um, Bitcoin has enjoys significantly more credibility, more visibility in every way possible. So, um, but you'll notice, yeah, we came to the, to the top of these standard deviation bands. This extra little bit right here, that was probably plus token Ponzi when they were scooping up shitloads of Bitcoin. Um, and then that was the literal day of the top was the day they got arrested. It was like a Chinese, it was a, it was a Chinese Ponzi where, um, you would buy Bitcoin and then send them your Bitcoin. And then they would like, they were supposed to send you some token back or something. And it was all just fraud. You get double Anyways, back. But the, <laughs> yeah. The classic, uh, you give me two, I'll, I'll give you 10 back. Um, but uh, yeah, so anyways, these standard deviations, the, the blue bands here, you can see that effectively like those act as a very solid reference point um, for sort of capping out. Um, now, hypothetically you said, okay, well, you know, we got above those bands back here and that can happen. That's why these aren't hard resistance um, in the term, like in the sense that like it's a line that you shall not cross, right? It's not a line in the sand, but it is an area. And right now we are in the area to expect that that things are topping out here. Um, especially when you look at the confluence of where that capping action happened um, in 2022 and and where we are now. So honestly, on Bitcoin, this is profit taking territory. However, I do think that with the ETF excitement and a bunch of other stuff and, and the macro still bullish and, and the reverse repo still having uh, maybe like 800 billion to dump somewhere into the markets. Um, I do think that I don't think that necessarily the run is over, but you just need to know that like we are now approaching that resistance area. Like it is now time to start thinking about taking profits, pulling a little bit off the table on your long-term trading stack, um, and potentially rotating into some shit coins. Um, you can already, see, and it might be a little bit late. Honestly, someone asked me, "Hey, what are your what are the your primary shit coins that you'd want?" And I'm like, eh, "Well, you know, it's hard for me to recommend to go buy shit coins right now because the time to do that was two months ago, three months ago um, when they were low. I personally have like a hard time." I'm not a trend trader, like right? I don't I don't like watching something pump and be like, oh, the trend is established. I will now buy 100% higher, 200% higher. I, I hate that. Like, I just I feel like I'm getting hosed when I do that, even if there might be plenty of more gains on the way. So that's like my own, my own emotional hang up. But um, I do think it, there's reasonably good chance that we continue to see some of the shit coins pop off. We continue to see uh, maybe like a rotation uh, from Bitcoin into shit coins. That's late 
traditionally how things play out, right? You get the big Bitcoin pump. Everyone says the bull's back on, and then you get the the flood into the shit coins um, and or altcoins. Not all of them are shit, but um, and, you know, and then and then everything crashes together. So I would probably guess at this moment that January would be the place to look for um for fall offs for crashes, if nothing else, and just because of the pattern that we've seen over Bitcoin's lifetime, where when some kind of major inclusion in the financial system happens, then it crashes, right? Um, the classic December 17th, 2020, uh, sorry, 2017, December 17th, 20, 2017, when it got included on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Um, and, and then that was the literal day of the top and then it just crashed or, um, April 14th when Coinbase released coin. Uh, and then that was the literal day of the top. Uh, or, or then when the ETS came out, uh, again in, in 2021, the, 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 the futures ETS, and that was like literally the week of the top. So if history is any lesson, uh, the release of the ETF is going to be bearish because insiders will be using that opportunity to dump onto whatever new money um, is now entering the market. So, and then, buddy, you think that's like then a, a temporary pullback, and then the climb continues, or it's an, a then a, a new trend of going back down? I think we're going to have to really wait and see. Um, I think that. I think there is a, still a market possibility. Like we're not out of the woods yet. Um, like right now it's, it's uh, 2019, you know, and event 201 is happening <laughs> and then next year, you know, there could be some big major crash. Like that's, oh, yes. there is still risk out there in the market that looks like that. I think there is still tail risk. I don't, I don't think that any of this is normal with the, with the reverse repos going up to two and a half trillion and then like dropping massively back down. They've only got another 800 billion left to come out of the reverse repos to sort of prop these markets up. Um, I mean, they've got other tricks. They've they've got other ways and means. So perhaps you know they, they'll figure something else out. Um, but uh, you know, and then also we've got we've got the fact that uh, let's go take a look at the bonds here. We we've still got the yield curve inversion happening. So things almost got back to slightly above zero, and then they inverted. You know, they went down again. So all the long term um, yields are moving down right now. Again, this is not. This is not imminent crash territory uh, at the moment, but um, you know this this isn't normal. I mean, it kind of <laughs> after the last couple of decades, it almost kind of is. But this is again a major, major sign that things are not right. Things don't look good. So I just think to myself, I don't think we're out of the woods. Is it going to be just a pullback? What they did in 2019, um, the markets kind of like broke a whole bunch of trend lines, went to the upside, pump, pump, pump. And they pumped all the way up until the crisis, right? Up until, uh, you know, that February timeframe um, when the whole thing started happening. And um, and then what I think that is, is like they pump the markets, they buy themselves room to crash. So when like the, the demand destroying event, the tail risk event, you know, whatever it is, when the crash happens, the ultimate low is significantly higher than it otherwise would have been. Um, so in this case, in terms of like Bitcoin, um, we would be, we would be looking at a, a situation where like, okay, if Bitcoin crashes here from 47,000, um, yeah, I mean, that crash is going to be bad, but it's going to be somewhere to the lower standard deviation area. It's going to be somewhere, um, it's going to be somewhere to the regression analysis, right? It'll be at, at the lowest, it'll be somewhere on this red line here. Um, if it loads, I guess it doesn't want to load. Th that's all right. I, I showed you guys this line many other times before, so. There we go. There's the red line. Um, it'll be somewhere to this red line area, right? Like it, it won't be down here at 7,000. It won't be at like 8,000 or even 11,000. Um, some of the, the more dire predictions that we saw. Um, I didn't I didn't really think that those were necessarily realistic numbers. I, I, I was suspicious that the red line could potentially break down. And at the moment that we were there, um, that red line was really like at the 14,000 area. We hit 15,5. Okay. Um, you know, that's, it's pretty close. Like that's actually remarkable for something that moves a thousand percent. Um, so anyways, yeah, the point is that I still like, maybe they can forego avert some kind of tail risk event. That, that's totally possible. I, I guess that they could do that if we get one, if we get a tail risk event, um, like let's go to the NASDAQ, for example, if something like that happens, uh, and we'll actually go to the weekly because this will be, you know, you'll be able to see more clearly. Um, this, this was the last time we had a, a tail risk event, uh, right. With the whole, the whole, uh, medical stuff that happened. So, and, and that drop off, um, let's take a look. I think that drop off was only like 30%. If I can get this to work, it always takes a second. Yeah, that's 32%. So, um, you know, if something similar happened here, like let's suppose the stock market breaks to new all time highs or gets very close 
and then it drops off by 30 percent well that's just double bottoming on the lows but um you know they seem to get ahead of these things more and more each time like okay 2001 crushed everyone 2008 um they responded a little bit faster um and then uh and then 2020 they like responded immediately and everything came back um, so, I mean, if, if some kind of risk event happens, like they're going to respond fast enough to recover the markets. And that's one thing that Jay Powell has said for a long time. He's like, listen, we're going to err on the side of raising too high and holding too high for too long because we can always recover the financial markets, <laughs> AKA we can always print our way out of, uh, out of stock market crashes. Um, so that's, um, you know, like, oh, and so you'll notice here on the stock market, you'll notice on the NASDAQ that, uh, things have, have broken their local uh, their local resistance. So yeah, we talked, we said, Hey, you know, of course, obviously that horizontal area, that, that local peak is going to be a spot of difficulty, but you know, then it just really jumped above it. The next spot is the all time high, right? All time highs incoming for, for the NASDAQ. Like that's what's happening here. So I don't yeah. think that this, go ahead. But if, if we, if we go on that track, right. And we keep going up and we break all time high for NASDAQ, obviously you would think crypto bull market would, would still be in play and just go along with that. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, the mechanism that drives both of these things is liquidity in the markets, right? It is, it is the ability to it's, it's just cash floating around there and then the ability to take leverage. So, um, yeah, if, if we see the Nasdaq going for new all time highs, then um, and continuing to go, that's just a sign that liquidity is, is still here in the markets. Um, I mean, right now from so we're looking at the wave magic in right again. Right now, these look pretty good. Like this is this is a nice looking wave magic. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you tend to see on the stock market. Normally, you don't just go from the bottom of lower standard deviations after a big washout like this, hit the upper, the long-term upper standard deviations, and then just keep pumping. That doesn't usually happen, but we're talking about the stock market. And as we've talked about before, the stock market is ever positive. It is like the headliner thing that, that the government wants you to say, hey, the economy is doing great. Everyone is doing fine. We're doing great managing the economy, and you should continue. Um, obeying us. So, um, but you know, like, so this is why this kind of signal, this kind of chart can do that on the stock market because it's, it is heavily managed to the upside, whereas most charts aren't going to act like this. So overall, like we are looking at, at a, at a chart, which looks like pretty bullish, like, especially on the long term, like we're on the daily here, but, um, but you can see like uh, for the next few months, like, okay, maybe some chop needs to happen here, but at some point next year, Unless there's a risk event like this thing that the wave magic would say this thing is is looking positive to set up into a new true macro bull market beyond its all time highs. Um, I think it makes some sense that these all time highs here, right, this horizontal area, that's going to be resistance. Like we're not just going to break that. One thing that you want to see, though, is that uh, you'll wick above that and then pull back. Right. If you wick above it and then pull back, that's like, hey, we technically made new all time highs. That feels optimistic. We're just consolidating like that's the kind of action that convinces people to buy. And, um, you know, you need the liquidity events, you need the government, you need the, the Fed, whatever, but you also need the real plebs. Like you need the real people not stampeding for the exits. So um, I think they did a decent job actually of managing the stock market from crashing too much. Um, I really don't want it to crash, honestly. Like I'm not a collapsitarian that thinks that my gold bars will buy me a city block. <laughs> you know, I would, I don't want my dad to lose his retirement, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, let's take a look at gold here real quick. Gold, uh, yeah, gold, gave us like a huge wick to new all-time highs um technically for for a moment and then pulled back so that's not too surprising we kind of talked about that that um you know being up here was probably going to be some kind of resistance and that and that there's still room in this chart to kind of um uh, you know for the cabal to 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 do their little tricks and and you know like i'm sure they had some profit here i'm sure that some people got exuberant and bought the bat you know bought other people's bags here at the top of this wick you know, they're going to keep this thing sideways. Again, we're looking at this. We want to see gold break to the upside. We want to see it break to new all-time highs to, I don't know, let's just say 25,000 or sorry, 2,500, uh, 2,500. We want this thing to start moving up again. Um, we want to see it convincingly in a bull market for us to really, um, for us to really believe that, um, uh, that it's, you know, to, to believe that we're going to enter a new bull market, uh, a new macro bull market in stocks and crypto. Um, right now, like, so if we go to the monthly, you can see that there's kind of like this rising wedge here. And this this wedge is probably going to break up. But you'll notice that, like, this doesn't end until 2030. So in terms of, like, how long can the government um, suppress gold and, like, sort of keep it capped down? Um, and are we ever going to suffer, like, some hyperinflationary event? 
the gold, this chart right here would suggest that we still have like another five years where they can, okay, got to release some pressure here. You know, it's going to do this. And then once that thing breaks up, then you, that's when we start actually seeing the potential for gold at 5,000, gold at 10,000, but we're not looking until after 2030. So in my mind, that would be a signal of like a, a significantly out of control inflation event. Um, they've been really good at being able to control inflation um, except for until lately, right? For 40 years, they've done reasonably okay at it, um, especially in the last two decades. So it seems like that system should break mathematically, but they've got so many tricks up their sleeve and they can manage things. And uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I mean, gold has the potential that like, it doesn't have to wait. It could just break out and, and keep going. But right now this, this triangle would suggest 2,600, 2,700. Um, there's other levels. Wave magic would suggest closer to 3,000. Um, so uh, let's take a look at the stats actually. Uh, no, that's not the right one. I mean, that is the right one, but we got to go to the daily for it to work properly. Um, so yeah, okay. The stats right now would suggest 3,200, right? So I, I would guess that in the next bull market, gold is looking at somewhere between 2,700 and let's just say 3,400 um, for like a, a topping out price. Um, at which point I would probably be selling pretty much all my gold and going into some kind of risk asset. So, uh, but that's, you know, that's more speculative. That's farther down the line in the future. It's, it's hard to see things beyond a year. Like when people say this is going to happen in, two, you know, in 18 months or 24 months, it's like, you don't know that that's too far down the line to see, unless you're just really, really, really good. And you've just got so much information. You're a true, ge true genius. I guess some, there are people like that out there. Um, but we probably don't know who they are and they're probably not posting on, on Twitter about it. So they're probably spending their days doing the analysis. Um, okay. So, uh, I guess that's about all. This is Bitcoin, Ethereum. Again, still kind of looking like it's hitting those uh, upper standard deviation levels. Um, oh, I wanted to look at shit coins for just a second. Uh, we, we can look at dominance too really quick. So dominance continues to sort of follow this, this wedge pattern that we'd seen up here when it was, uh, tagging the top of that, that was a good opportunity to, to buy some shit coins. Um, you know, if this thing breaks down, like if, if this thing goes to the downside and then breaks to the downside, that's actually a really good sign um, for significant shitcoin gains uh, to continue. So you might you might watch that. Um, but uh, I, I have no, no idea if this thing will break to the upside or the downside. It looks like it starts to find an end somewhere here and somewhere in, in March, right? So this thing could just continue oscillating to the upside. Um, but like a, a shift in the macro profile of like the current uptrend, um, that that should break the Bitcoin dominance um, chart right there. Like that that should break that pattern. Um, so the last thing I wanted to look at here was just relative shitcoin performance. Um, let's see, AVAX and ADA, for whatever reason, those guys have been pumping. Um, when we when we see shitcoins popping off a few at a time, to me that's a signal of like they don't have the full liquidity that they would want to sort of like pump everything all at once. So they they do the best they can. They pump this and then they wait and then they pump that. Right? We had the Dogecoin cycle um, was happening, and then we had the uh, right now we're having like the AVAX and uh, and ADA cycle, uh, Mr. Charles Hoskinson's coin. He's probably celebrating. Um, I didn't. I didn't put Soul on here. I need to put Soul. Um, I don't know what ha what's happening with them. Um, so, anyways, yeah, that's what shit coins are looking like. Litecoin and um, <laughs> and Binance token uh, in the in the doldrums, doing nothing. Um, I guess I'm fine with that. Whatever. I don't care about Litecoin or Binance coin or hardly any of these other coins either. Uh, let's see. So, is there anything you guys wanted to look at, or uh, if not, I think that's no, um, no, no. Oh. let's get over it. Go ahead, buddy. La sorry, last last thing. I, I always say this. It's always it's always like a kid that's like, just one more. <laughs> um, so this is the Bitcoin transaction count. And I just thought it was funny. Let's take a look at three years. So you can see Bitcoin, the transaction counts that were happening were basically 300,000 um, for the bear market, you know, under, under 300,000 for the bull market back here in 2021. Uh, we were looking at 300 to 350. And then I don't know, something happened in April of this year where it just like <laughs> just totally went crazy. So anything in my mind, anything above the trend and the trend was basically um, 300,000. We'll just say 300,000 just to give it like the best. And then now the trend is, I mean, wildly, I don't know exactly, like just wildly oscillating. But this is all NFTs, right? This is all ordinals. This is all um, BRC 20s that you can't, like there's no decks. You can't even trade it on Bitcoin. It's not like... Like Ethereum, at least you can buy a shitcoin and then like use Uniswap and get some liquidity in and out or whatever. Right. Um, but like you can't even do that. You have to rely on centralized trading platforms for all these ordinals. Um, and yeah, they're oscillating between, let's just say, four hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand. But on the bright side, this is taproot adoption. 
Um, this is what they wanted. So, you know, it's here. We got taproot adoption finally. Uh, and I mean, big, big, big topic. I don't know if we want to get into it. We could get into it later on the show. Uh, obviously, there's been lots of talk of censorship that's happening uh, or theoretically starting to happen in Bitcoin. And then just, you know, coming to a point with, a you know, a potentially seeing another community split in Bitcoin, um, you know, similar to what we saw with the block size debate back in the day. Right. Like, I feel like we're, we're kind of really coming to a head. There seems to be two two groups in Bitcoin forming. I don't know. Any yeah, thoughts? it is very interesting. Um one thing is clear, they're not going to have consensus. I don't think they, there's no way they're going to be able to get consensus um, for like excluding ordinals at this point. Mm -hmm. So are the maxis going to violate, but will it be a violation? Because like, okay, the maximalist camp has Blockstream and they've got, um, they, they've got the people that have merge, um, merge authority over the repo, mm -hmm. right? So Technically speaking, they wouldn't even have to, to fork the repo. They would keep the same repo. Um, and I think that that's, that's powerful. I think that, you know, if you get all the lead devs, all the lead guys, and there are people out there like, oh, there's no such thing as a shut up. Yes, there is. Like, there's, uh, there's about 10 people in Bitcoin that if they all said, let's raise the block size or let's block ordinals or whatever, like, there's 10 people out there approximately. And if they said it, then, ever, like, all the maxis would fall behind. Um, but I even have maximalist friends that, that like ordinals. So I don't, yeah. I don't think they're going to. It seems like it's it's kind of like uh you know a little like it's it sounds nice like okay they're they're gonna split off they're gonna have like this big split um I don't think they'll do it I think that's too much pride for the maximalists to eat um and I don't think that they they'll be able to do it like it's it's just so contentious they they just won't have a choice if there's any hope at ever motivating change in Bitcoin I think it will be after the next bull market um. Like, let's suppose Bitcoin caps out at 200K next bull, next bull and fees are like, I don't know, let's, there's probably some math we could do to like estimate where the fees would be if Bitcoin capped out at 200K. But let's just say fees are like consistently $200. Uh, and then, it you know, Bitcoin pulls back to, let's say, 70K and then fees are still like $50. Um, and then Lightning Network suffers as a result and there's still a shitload of ordinals. Um, that will motivate, I think, people to be like, you know what, maybe we need to merge some soft work like CTV, or maybe we need to raise the block size, or maybe we need to reprice fucking reprice the ordinals. Um, right. Like that's, it's, it's like, I just, I think it's going to be hard for them to get motivated to really come to a consensus to do anything until the pain is significant because if the pain's not that bad and their price is going up, but like if their price is going down and there's still high fees, like that's a double hit and they'll be like, okay, maybe it's time to change. All right. I'm sure we'll talk about it more perhaps later. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you.